to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scripture records in john 3 verse 23 that John was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. We welcome you today to our study of the subject of baptism. Today we're going to be thinking about the subject of the mode of baptism. Why do some people baptize babies? And why do some people pour a little water or sprinkle some water on some? And then what about immersion? What does the Scripture teach on the mode of baptism. Stay tuned as we're going to look to God's Word to discover His answer. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. As we think today about the subject of baptism, we want to let the Scripture teach us what God says on the mode of baptism. And friend, by mode we mean is baptism by sprinkling? In many people, uh, in various religious groups, when a baby is born and gets just barely old enough, they will take that baby down and they will sprinkle a little water on him and call that baptism. Others may take a cup or a handful of water and pour it on someone's head. And then there is the idea as well that baptism is immersion, full body immersion. Today we ask the question, what does the Bible say about the mode, the correct mode of baptism? And friend, as we're going to look today at the evidence from Scripture, the answer is overwhelmingly from the Bible that baptism is always immersion in the Scripture and that God expects us to follow that simple plan that He has laid out from the Word of God. And so today we're going to offer three proofs to show that the word baptism and the idea of baptism is that of immersion. The first proof, naturally, is the Scriptures. What does the Scripture say? Jeremiah 37, 17 and Romans 4, verse 3 is the overwhelming answer and the authoritative proof on this subject. Then we're going to look to the language of the New Testament of which uh, Jesus spoke and the New Testament was wrote in and we're going to see what does that word baptism mean and then a third proof will be that of church history. What did they do close to the time of the New Testament? Now I understand as well as you that the main authority is the Word of God and that is first and foremost where we want to direct our attention on this subject. There are four major passages which will overwhelmingly teach 
that baptism is by immersion. And those four passages show us from different venues and angles how people baptized in what the mode of baptism was in the New Testament. I want to direct your attention first of all to John chapter 3 and I want you to look in verse number 23 with me. That's John chapter 3. Take your Bible and notice what the Scripture records as John is doing some precursory work to Christ coming on, getting the people ready for the Messiah as his job was. Notice what the Scripture says in John 3 verse 23. The Bible says, Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim. Watch this now. Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now let's think about this text, and let's ask some questions relative to the mode of baptism. Why did John baptize in this region? Could have got a little water from anywhere. Why did he go to Anon near Salim? Well, the answer is because there was much water there. Now, let's ask another question. Which of the three modes that are most popular today, sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, which of those three requires or demands much water? Friend, it doesn't take much water to sprinkle a little on somebody's head or to pour a little on their body somewhere. But if I'm going to take a full-grown adult and I'm going to fully immerse him under the water, friend, that takes much water. The editorial comment that John was baptizing where there was much water bears no significance to the idea of sprinkling or pouring, but it does, looking with the rest of the evidence of the New Testament, affirm that Jesus did baptize as well as John where there was much water because that is what was demanded at the time. All right, let's look at another text in Acts chapter 8, and this is the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch in the New Testament. What did people do as the mode of baptism when conversion took place, when someone became a Christian? Does the Bible indicate what the proper mode of baptism was? And friend, it absolutely does. I want you to look in Acts chapter 8, and you'll notice beginning in verse 37, or actually verse 36, as they went down the road, the Bible says they came to some water, a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now notice, So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now, here's a man on a long journey, leaving Jerusalem, headed back to Egypt in an area of land in a time of day where there wasn't a convenience store on every corner and where they naturally would have brought water to drink as well, why did they need to stop the chariot? Why did they need to both get out of the chariot? Why did they both go down into the water? Now friend, you think about this. If pouring or sprinkling was the proper mode, why couldn't one of them go down to the water? Why did they have to both go down and get in the water? Hey, somebody can go to the water. Somebody can stand on dry ground, and you can pour a little water on his head. Why did they, they stop the chariot? Why did they both get out of the chariot? Why did they both go down in the water? And they came up out of the water again. You see clear evidence that in the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch, you have a, a picture of immersion and what's going on in that context. But two of the clearer passages that we see, maybe even uh, a little more visibly relating to the mode of baptism, are found in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Would you turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 1 with me? And I want you to notice what happened at the baptism of Jesus. People are often asking the great question, what would Jesus do? Friend, let's ask that question as it relates to the mode of baptism. When Jesus was baptized, He being our perfect example, 1 Peter 2.21, He being the one whom we follow in His footsteps, what did Christ do concerning the mode of baptism? Notice Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse number 9. 
It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And notice verse 10, And immediately coming up from the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Notice again Mark 1 verse 9, And immediately, verse 10, coming up out of the water, from the water. He saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. The literal Greek word there in that text is the word ek, which means out of, literally. And so, and coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. Now, here's the question for us to consider. For a person to come up out of water, what must he first do? Go down into water. Greek scholar Kenneth Woost, when he commented on Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, said this, Clearly, immersion is in view here. In the next verse, ek, out, is used. Literally, out from within. Jesus was baptized into the river, and He came up out of the water, Greek scholar Kenneth Woost says, relating to that context and that passage. And so when we think about Jesus and, and what's going on there in the context of our Lord being baptized, we can know that Scripture teaches Christ was immersed. Now friend, here's the question we want to ask. If the mode of baptism for Jesus was immersion, shouldn't that be good for us as well? Shouldn't that be good enough for us as well? Uh, what about sprinkling? What about pouring? You don't find that in the New Testament. That came later on in history. But what Jesus did, that's good enough for me. And that ought to be good enough for you, for anyone who's trying to please the Savior as well. Let's then direct our attention to another illustration Paul uses relative to baptism, which helps us to learn about its mode. Would you look in your Bible in Romans chapter 6? beginning in verse number 1. That's Romans chapter 6. Paul here, in addressing the issue of baptism and its relation to grace, teaches us uh, about an illustration, gives us an illustration, which helps us to learn about the mode of baptism as well. Notice Romans 6 verse 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Now verse 4, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Listen to those words again in verse 4. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death. The process here is death to sin, burial with Christ in baptism, and then resurrection like unto Christ to walk in newness of life. And so you've got the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But friend, the burial directly relates to one's baptism. Would Paul choose a mode of describing baptism, an illustration of describing baptism that contradicts the mode? Well, of course not. What does that illustration teach us about the mode? Well, friend, the illustration is that of a burial. Baptism is a burial with Christ. Well, let's think about that just a moment. You think about maybe the last time you went to a graveside. You went to a funeral and there at the graveside and you're standing and at the close of the funeral, what do they do with that body when they bury it? Do they take it, lay it on the ground, and sprinkle a little dirt on top of it? Do they pour two or three shovelfuls of dirt on top of it? No. We all realize that a burial is a complete encasing, engulfing, or immersing of the body in the ground. Let me illustrate. They take that body, they dig a hole uh, in the ground, six feet deep sometimes, and they place that body in that hole. It's covered by dirt on the bottom covered by dirt on every side. What do they do next? Then they take all the dirt from which they dug that hole and they cover it on top of the body until the last piece of dirt is covered. What does that body do then? That body is completely encased, engulfed, 
the picture of baptism being a burial clearly shows that in the Bible, baptism is engulfing or immersing one in the water. And so if we're going to let the Bible speak, then friend, we can clearly see that these four scriptures, John 3, 23, much water, Acts 8, Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water, Mark 1, Jesus came up out of the water, had to go down into it first, and Romans 6, 4 clearly teach that in the New Testament, the mode of baptism that was used was that of immersion. But then let's turn our attention to a second proof or a second source for learning about uh, the idea of baptism. Now, again, we understand the Scripture is the main authority, but we can also learn about the mode of baptism from the language in which our New Testament was wrote. Now, let me illustrate the difference today. We say baptism, and someone might think uh, the word could mean sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. kind of has become that way in the minds of many people. What did the word, the Greek word, baptizo, what did that word mean in the New Testament? Well, the majority of Greek lexicons and scholars define baptizo simply as to dip, to immerse, to plunge, or to submerge. However, the most convincing evidence from the Greek is the everyday word, the everyday usage of the word baptizo. Let me illustrate. Greek scholar Marvin Vincent notes that in classical Greek, here it is, in classical Greek, the primary meaning of baptizo is to immerse. Thus, Polybius, describing a naval battle of the Romans and the Carthaginians, said they sank, baptized, many of the ships. Now, you imagine this. Here are the Romans and the Carthaginians, and they're at war, and a, a scholar of that day, a, a writer of that day, describes what happened to one of the ships, and he says they baptized one of their ships. What do you mean? They, they sprinkled it a little with water? No. What happened? In that war, they sank. They fully submerged one of the enemy ships. And the word used to describe that in the classical Greek day was the word baptizon, kin to our word baptizo. Now, another example. Greek scholar W.E. Vine says baptizo was used among the Greeks to signify the dyeing of a garment or drawing of water by dipping one vessel into another. Thus, Plutarchus uses it of the drawing of wine by dipping the cup into the bowl. How would you get that wine out? Dipped it in? What do you mean? Put it in the water. Submerge the ladle. That's the idea, to get the wine out. Dying of a garment. You take that garment and you submerge it on the water. And you have to do it multiple times was the idea of the dying, but the word used was that of baptizo. And so in classical Greek, when they used this word in their everyday language, it related to the idea of immersion. For in just as the word baptizo in the first century was used to mean to, to sink or to dip, to plunge or immerse, it's got to mean the same thing for us today. Let me give an illustration. The Catholic scholars even confess this. They say fundamentalists are correct when they point out that the Greek word used in the New Testament for baptism is baptizo and that this means immersion or dunking only. When you, when you study the, the language of the New Testament, when you study the Greek language, you're not going to walk away saying, well, here's an example of where baptizo meant sprinkle or pour. You don't find that. The majority of times, the main usage of it, and probably the only, is when we find it being used as immersion. Now, let me illustrate the difference. What's interesting about the Greek language and its use in the New Testament is this. The word baptizo in the New Testament and in the Greek language meant to immerse or to submerge. Now, if God wanted to teach us that baptism is sprinkling, there was another whole word for that, and it's the word rantizo. It's used in Hebrews chapter 9 of the sprinkling of the blood upon the altar. And so here we've got a word for baptism, and we've got a word for sprinkling. Got a word for immersion and have a specific word for sprinkling of things on the altar. God chose the word baptizo, immersion. And so it wasn't as though God didn't have another word to choose, that there wasn't a specific word for sprinkling. There was and God chose the word immersion. Now, let's offer then a third source to help us understand 
what baptism is, and this is the testimony of those who are living close to the time of the first century. And again, we're not saying this is absolutely in and of itself authoritative. Scripture is. The language confirms that, but history will also buttress this idea up as well. During the first three centuries after Christianity began, there are no accounts of baptism being sprinkling. You just don't find that. For example, Tertullian, a second century Christian, recorded that baptism itself is a bodily act because we are immersed in water, but it has a spiritual effect because we are set free from sin. And so here we've got a man living close to the time of the first century, second century writer, and he affirms the idea that baptism is immersion. Uh, I'll give you another example. Cyril of Jerusalem, a uh, third century follower of Christ, also gives insight to the mode of baptism when he says this, For as he who plunges into the water and is baptized, now listen, and is surrounded on all sides by the water, so were they also baptized completely by the Spirit. Now, here's a graphic illustration from not too far from the time of the first century. Cyril said that when one was baptized, he was surrounded on all sides by the water. What's that sound like? A burial. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And so we can clearly see that baptism in the New Testament is by immersion. Now, as we mentioned, the Greek speaking people of that day did have a specific word for sprinkle. That's the word, not baptizo, but rantizo. The word is used several times in the New Testament to convey the clear idea of sprinkling, but it's never associated with baptism. It's used in Hebrews 9, 13, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 19, Hebrews 10, verse 20. Now, he, for here's what's so interesting about that. If the Greeks had a word for sprinkling, and the New Testament writers, the Holy Spirit, chose to use a distinct word for immersion. How can we say there's biblical authority for sprinkling as the proper mode of baptism today? And so church history also helps us to understand how sprinkling became a, an accepted substitute by some for immersion. And so we, we think about this. If the Bible teaches, if Scripture teaches, if the language affirms, if history coincides with that, where did sprinkling and pouring come from? How did that come about? Well, from church history we learn that there are two reasons or two ideas from which sprinkling kind of became a, a practice by some. First, sprinkling began as an option for someone who's maybe bedridden or some paraplegic person. So basically you have some writings uh, a little while after the time of the New Testament, 4th, 5th century, you've got some writings of people, some man who's a paraplegic and somebody who's bedridden and wants to be baptized. And so somebody comes up with the idea of, well, let's pour a little water on them. Friend, is that what God wanted? Is that acceptable? You know, I've seen accounts, you may have seen accounts, where people who could not physically walk up into a baptistry, people helped them and they got baptized. But regardless, does that example mean that we should throw out all the evidence about baptism being immersion? Of course not. Could they have found a way for that person to be baptized? No doubt they could have, but regardless either way, that doesn't change what the Scripture teaches about baptism. But then a more even telling reason for sprinkling to come about takes us uh, even to the idea of that being uh, original sin. For example, there are many after the first century who believed in the doctrine of original sin, a false doctrine which says we're born with sin. Ezekiel 18 clearly teaches, Ezekiel 20, that's not the case, that we don't inherit the sin of our fathers, but that false doctrine became popular. And so here, imagine this, babies are born sinners. To be saved, one must be baptized. You cannot, think about this, if a baby's born a sinner and they believe to be saved you had to be baptized, as the scripture teaches, you've got a big problem. How are you going to take an infant and baptize it without drowning it? Therefore, sprinkling came in as a substitute in some people's mind for the idea of baptism. 
But friend, based on a false doctrine, based on false ideas and false assumptions, that's not founded upon the Scripture. Jesus said in Matthew 18, Bring the little children to me, of such is the kingdom of heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that we're born sinners, but from a big part, from that idea, sprinkling came in. And so friend, here's what we consider today. The language and teaching of the Scripture in the New Testament affirms that baptism is always by immersion. The language of the Greek New Testament, as you study that, teaches us that the major usage and definition for the word baptizo was immersion. The scriptures teach us it's immersion. The language teaches us it's immersion. History, close to the first century, teaches us it's immersion. And we learn how sprinkling and pouring came about as false ideas. Now, here's what we want to consider relative to this. Friend, all, here's what we ask of you today. We want you to consider your own baptism. Um, were you baptized in the correct mode? Was your baptism by immersion into Christ for the forgiveness of sins mark chapter 16 verse 16 if not then friend we encourage you to continue with us in this series of lessons as we further delve into the ideas about baptism and if you know what you need to do if you've heard the Word of God from the scriptures and you've got faith in that message Romans 10 17 if you believe Jesus is God's Son, John 8, verse 24, would you be willing to change your life, repent of sin, make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and would you, to have your sins washed away, be baptized, immersed into Christ for the remission of your sins? Friend, if you've never done that, this is a serious matter. This is a matter that the scriptures are clear on and out of love and compassion and a, and a desire for you to go to heaven. We ask you today to get your Bible out, search the scriptures, look at the evidence. If these things are so, obey them because God said so, for He's the one we'll ultimately give an account to. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.